I've been thinking about games a lot, mostly owing to what I've been doing at my local game store and what I do for a living now. And while I wanted to do a video on Gundam Build Divers for, well, basically since it came out, I don't really think that I was in the right space for it until I started doing what I do out there in the real world. So let me explain. I had taken up the mantle at my local game store, uh, building community and running Warhammer 40k tournaments in about 2020 and still am to this day. And then that branched out into helping run Bolt Action, but primarily I started working on Battletech. For those of you who are just like, oh, I thought you hated Battletech, well, uh, kindly fuck off and re-watch that video that made you think that. Idiot. Anyway. I think it's given me a very strange appreciation for what Gundam Bill Divers brings to the table. 2018 prof probably wouldn't have seen those particular woods for the trees, but 2024 prof very much does. So with that all well in mind, let's get some groundwork for Bill Divers out of the way. While I loved the shit out of the first two seasons, the reaction from a lot of people who enjoyed those series was resoundingly meh when it came to Divers, which is technically the third season, I guess. And while I'll cop to being one of them at the time, my reasoning was more to do with the tech side than the setting. I'd remind you all that one of the main characters in Build Fighters was from a different goddamn dimension, and the entire idea behind it involved Plavsky particles to make toys beat the shit out of each other. But Divers takes place after those series, and instead replaced the GP system with a dot hack sign style VR rig thingamajig pilot egg. I don't know. Whatever it's supposed to be, it's a lot more complicated than it needs to be. So while that makes it easier to play with people across the planet, I can't imagine how hard it must have been to get Bandai to put in rollback netcode. It turns out that when you have a virtual world that you can experience like real life, even when it's supposedly based on Gundam, that means you can do a lot of strange things with your character, including, but not limited to, being a cat girl. Being an ogre, being a literal fucking wolf, and being Patrick Colasauer. It also allows you to have the username of a famous war criminal while also being a four foot tall stoat while piloting a Gundamized Votom. Like, I'm pretty sure somewhere around here they lost the thread. It's in this goofball world that we meet our heroes, Riku and Yuki, as they make their first quote unquote dive into the world of Gundam Battle Network. This is not to be confused with Mega Man Battle Network, Battle Net, or anything along those lines. Riku is a cookie-cutter 14-year-old designated protagonist, Yuki is the designated sidekick, and they're later joined by Momoka, designated bimbo, and Sarah, designated weirdo. While there are heroes, there also are excuse to look at the pack of nut jobs that inhabit this dot hack sign but less dreary world. And if you're thinking right now that I'm name dropping dot hack sign, a show that came out in the mid 2000s, an awful lot, you'd be correct because it's got a lot of DNA through it. Uh, you'll see. Now you may think I'm being somewhat lackadaisical about describing our main heroes, but you remember how Say was a big dweeb and had like a big family and a backstory like that? Yeah, not a whole lot of that is going on with this cast of quote-unquote characters. Again, for the first chunk of this series, don't think of them as Gundam characters. Think of them like RPG characters. It's no accident that there are so many similarities between, say, Dragon Quest or some of the earlier Final Fantasy games here. This is not a show that has depth of character as its main draw. I don't want to say that this is out of lazy writing or anything like that, but I think someone on the writing staff got the assignment a little too well. The point was to introduce some wild and crazy shit to really stretch the limits of the world and teach some good lessons about gamesmanship and passion for a hobby. This isn't strictly about gunpla and all that. This is probably more like Baby's first free company, or maybe more accurately, how not to be a total cockbite in an MMO. Likewise, the outset of the series really accurately taps into a lot of things about competitive miniature games like Warhammer, Star Wars Legion, Battletech, all that sort of thing. These are toys that we're playing with, but they're toys that we give a shit about. Because it's not just a game, it's a hobby. People can get deep into that, deep into the lore, deep into the world building. And while it definitely was a factor in the original Build Fighters, it's a lot more front and center in Build Divers. That really appeals to me personally as a wargamer, but it's also nice to see this expanded on now that it's possible to do a lot more with it due to the MMO nature. One of the more important things that it does tap into is how to make a welcoming and inviting atmosphere for people who are new to the game. Upon entering the world, our main players meet up with Maggie. She kinda bad though. Is that Frost? Whoa.
and definitely give off the sense that Japan still hasn't quite gotten its head around certain modern gender ideas. At any rate, they're the kind of player that you definitely want helping new kids to get their head around the basic concept of the game. The important thing is, as always, to have fun. If you come out the gate expecting to be top tier immediately, you're going to get squished and you're going to get demoralized. There is also a bunch of other high tier players who help Riku and his crew out, and they're not particularly well fleshed out, all told. There's furry bait fighter guy, cat boy build expert, and then there's the two more interesting characters. There's Commander, who pilots hero suits, and General, who is also a ferret. Well, I'm always happy for some ridiculousness dichotomy in my Gundam, it did feel like there was a missed chance here to use old characters that, you know, already had two series under their belts. This lack of particular cohesion is probably going to chafe those who are down with build fighters at this point, and we're hopeful for a new series, and, well, yet here we are. But all is not well in the world of GBN. There are people who have something called break decals that are hyper-boosting their stats and making the world unstable. Now, you might be thinking that, well, doesn't that really break TOS? And you'd be completely correct in asking that. The show addresses this pretty directly, in fact, and their explanation is, we're powerless to do anything because that would mean this show doesn't happen. Okay, fine. Breath of fresh air, that. But since this is causing incredible instability, it's up to the denizens of GBN to kick out the malefactors. How do they do this? <laughs> By fighting them in-game. Now you might be saying to yourself, gee, Prof, that sounds like a fucking dumb idea considering they're already just straight up cheating. And you'd be correct. No, they don't They don't actually change it. it. They just act like nothing's wrong or weird. Admittedly, they're trying to catch these dudes on screen with their cheating stuff, but at this point I don't get why the company is so hell-bent on not acting when we've seen people get hardware banned for much less than this, even 10 years ago. Something, 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 rollback, netcode, something, something, dinosaurs need meteors, I don't know. Now, this brings us to the next couple players in Riku's crew. We've got the master builder, who barely knows how to play, but he makes really good mechs. And the sexy ninja, who is very obviously a traitor the entire time. Ayame is probably the most fleshed out character in this whole shebang, as someone has their hooks in her and is puppeting her around for the first half of the show. The other guy just kind of blends into the background, like the beige character that he is. Not for any fault of his own, but just because he's there because they needed a full team. And yes, he does have a name, K-O-1, or Koichi, but as I'm writing it, I couldn't friggin' remember it because of his lack of impact. So that's a problem, but it's also the end state of a poorly constructed ensemble cast. You remember Sarah, the weird kid who barely registers and doesn't pilot anything? Yeah, she's an honest-to-god artificial intelligence. The viewers who remember my anime and AI video from a while back probably also clocked this already, but somehow, feelings can make an AI happen in a game now. But yeah, Sarah just leapt fully formed from the proverbial godhead, because reasons. And she's a much bigger threat to GBN than the break divers, because they can't reboot the system without shutting her down. Shutting down the entire system? You can get somebody else because I won't do it. I shutting will not. down the system. I'm admittedly no tech expert. But can't you just put her on a fucking flash drive or something? Don't get me wrong, I'm approaching this as someone who's long expressed a distaste for maudlin sci-fi tropes that don't really make any sense. But if she's in GBN's code, can't you just partition that off or stick her on a different server? Do you guys not have different servers? Folks, we live in a world where we already know how an MMO works, and none of this really makes any sense. But then on the other hand, if she's more than just a batch of code as in a living entity, then I think Lockheed Martin probably wants a word with her. Or at least Raytheon. Raytheon, we make a knife missile. Ha! Ah. Like, this is basically what all those AI tech bro morons think their stupid LLMs are. Except this one is actually alive, I guess. Honestly, there's a strange sort of learned helplessness to all of these characters. The giant corporation is helpless in the face of people cheating boldly in their own game. The AI that should be able to pull the strings of the game to protect herself is too much of a bubblehead to do so, or just doesn't know how to? It, no, it's up to the good old-fashioned plucky protagonist to try and protect her. And all of a sudden, I'm pining for Westworld. Look, this show is mid at best and plummets downwards towards fucking awful at the end. It wipes the slate clean so hard from what went on before that it seems like a weird waste of time. I liked Sei and Reiji. 
I liked Team Try. I have less than no interest in Riku's team of brain-dead, half-assed character designs that also seem to speak lions. This does bring me to a sidebar, however. There's a guy that Riku has to fight in the old-school way that basically wrecks his mini, and he's shown to be kind of a grognard. Now, if you're not familiar with the term... That's a gamer term for the old grumbly asshole that runs off the new kids who are just trying to enjoy the RPG or tabletop game. I never found myself rooting for that guy, though he did have a couple of kind of cool designs. But I did understand a little bit of why he was such a shithead. Well, tabletop games or RPGs can't actually be quote-unquote ruined or any of that by the inclusion of new players and fresh blood. I did understand the frustration that comes with the fact that they upended everything that I liked about it. Now, is the solution to blitz the new kids and run them off? Hell no. That's not a thing that a stable person would do. As a well-rounded adult myself, or at least pretending to be, it's important to understand what you enjoyed about something and seek out that particular aspect without using it as a bludgeon towards other people. Some of you are going to get in the comments after that one. So what does that mean for build divers? Well, it's a goddamn mess, but messes can be untangled, and there's some cool mech designs in here. The ones that are fun, interesting, and don't feel like half-assed clip-on parts, at least. Hi, Yuki's GM, I'm looking specifically at you right now. But ultimately, it's kind of a shameless cash grab to try and get more kits sold of less popular designs. The main Gundam is from Gundam Age, for fuck's sakes. But at the end of the day, what, what do we really do with it? Well, we take what we like, and we don't worry about the rest. As something here to build on, pun intended, and we'll give it a revamp with re-rise. Not everything has to be a full-throated success, even in the cutthroat industry of animation. Just, you know, don't tell the bean counters that. By the end of the series, Riku gets his ass pummeled a few times trying to rescue Sarah, because friendship and all that. But by then, it becomes abundantly clear that the heroes are actually in the wrong. By the time GBN has the capacity to fix the problem, which would cause Sarah to be deleted, partition her away somewhere, improve game stability somehow, talk about development debt, come on, the heroes have tried admirably to come up with a plan to rescue her. But that plan carries a 95% chance that it fucks up GBN. And this comes directly on the heels of Rommel saying that there are people who can walk and talk only in GBN. They try to push back and say that Rommel will be haunted by the things he's done, but I don't think he will be, and I'm pretty sure he's got the right of it. The next time he meets somebody who can walk and talk freely in GBN thanks to his action in his game, I think he'll be fine. In short, fuck off, Riku. Your plan sucks, and you're going to make people's lives worse. Rommel has the right of it. Sorry your little AI loli has to bite the dust, but if the code's there, I'm sure she'll toddle back on in a few months. The needs of the many actually do matter more than the needs of the few, even though that one's your friend. Even though Riku takes a stand, it's gotta be a TOS violation. Just log him out, upload the patch, or send the Pinkertons after him. Fuck if I care. Well, again, this might be the cantankerous old man in me. If you have a minuscule chance of success and a huge chance of fucking up everything, maybe learn to deal with loss. When Evangelion did that whole less than 1% chance thing, the return on success was the angel was defeated. The fail state was the literal end of the world. So there's no harm in trying. This, this is break everybody else's toy because we're too stupid to tell the difference between a person and chat GPT. Honestly, the ending being, no, you can't just try and play a game to solve this problem would have been a hell of a capstone to this. But I don't think the build series is the place to throw around something subversive like that. Even though the end of the series does throw up another roadblock, it really only proves that Riku and his team are a bunch of morons. Anyway, the whole thing ends with somewhere between Angelic Lair and Sam Altman's most furious wank dream, and nothing ever went wrong again. Now, I'm not saying it should have ended with a long legal battle and that Lockheed Martin would be sending operators to kidnap the AI, but that would have been more thematically interesting than let's all meet up in the real world and we're all immediately recognizable and none of us are visibly handicapped or anything like that. Again, dot hack sign definitely ran so Gundam Build Divers could trip over its own dick. It's not exactly wrapping itself in glory, that's for damn sure, but this was kind of the perfect encapsulation of how not to do this kind of story. There's no character development, the stakes are zero until they're so high that it's insane to let them get there, and 
everything just feels so goddamn tidy at the end of it. Well, gee, what if one of these characters didn't look like their in-game counterpart, you know, within reason? What if one of them was, again, visibly disabled? And the weight of what Riku might have done to an important socialization outlet actually hit him? What if someone thought for more than 30 seconds about the goddamn story? What indeed? 